Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk Podcast, Training Camp 2022 upon us. There's Matt Castle, if you're watching on your YouTube. Down low is this tanned and really rugged looking Phil Perry. Rugged. 202. He's got a little mm. facial hair. Castle looks rested. How's my guys? Yeah, I'm feeling great. You know what? We had a little trip out to California, got to see some family, a little rest, relax, relaxation, some beach. It was fantastic. Phil, where you been? Castle's always relaxed. I, I would love to know what it looks like now, you know, when he's not relaxed, because I just feel like he's always in that mode. I was uh, just doing um, just some some local stuff just down staycation. Cape Cod. Yeah, well, a little staycation, a little Cape Cod. And we're Ooh. good now. We're ready to go. We're on the wheel. It's training camp week. All it's right. Time. You can tell you get the vibe right there, Matt, from Phil. Oh, yeah. He's ready. Go grab it's game time. Well, it's going to be a Super Bowl in the offing this year. Phil and I will get deep into that tomorrow as we start to look at our Patriots storylines. But today, I think what's fun is using Castle for the resource that he is, which is to take us inside the Patriots where he was for such a long time. And I want you to give us simple ABC instructions. How long have you been there as of the Tuesday, two days before camp? And what have you been up to as a Patriots quarterback? Right. Usually I'd get there about a week before, kind of get settled in, make sure, you know, all your ducks are in order because once you're in camp, it is training camp mode. And that means, I mean, especially back then, right? The the rules are a lot different now with the a lot more walkthroughs, days off. All that. Back then it was the two a day method, right? And it was in full pads and there was no light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. at all. And so you kind of, you were there, you were making sure you're ready for the conditioning test. That's something that I think still every player will tell you, if you have to run a conditioning test, you, it, it still just gives you anxiety because you're like, am I ready? Am I, am I physically in shape? You know you are, but there's something about a test in front of all the coaches, in front of all your peers, that you want to make sure that you're ready to go. So, so, you're you, running haven't, the so you haven't gotten to the test yet. You're there a week early. Are you trying to I'm make there up a week the lost time? Yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm just making sure that I'm in tip-top shape getting into camp and then also doing a little throwing whoever's around, just kind of getting everything everything ready to go, revving your engine a little bit. And then camp comes around, you're checking into the hotel, and then you, you get what to hotel? the – it the one in Foxborough, which was like more of an extended stay. We actually had our own room. We had a little kitchen area and stuff like that. There was really two to a room, and so it was. Uh, what hotel was that? Gosh, it might have been a resident. How did yeah, Bill probably, greet you? Are, are you guys Phil? I'm sure you got questions. I want to. I want to really hammer how how day to day goes. Is Bill catching you on the way into the facility and saying, "Hey, welcome in." Or do you let them know prior to arriving, hey, I'm going to be on Wednesday. Do you tell McDaniels or the offensive coordinator? How does it work? Well, it works because they give you basically your itinerary for the week leading into camp. So you know, hey, I've got to be at the hotel checked in by this point, right? So you've got to be there between, say, 3 and 5 o'clock right between three and five o'clock on the day before you're supposed to start the conditioning test. And then usually what happens is you check in at the hotel, you put all your stuff in, and then you have a night meeting that night. And that really kicks things off. And, and that night meeting you come in, that's where Bill greets you. He's not sitting at the door like, hey, great to see you guys, all that stuff. It's more like, okay, now training camp has officially started in that night meeting. And you get into night meetings and you go in and he kind of gives you what we're going to be doing, kind of just a general overtake. And then really it starts with the – the back then it started with the following day, the conditioning test. And for skill position, like I'm talking about wide receivers, I'm talking about DBs, those guys, they had to run 60s. So you have to run 20 60s, 30-second rest with a minute – I believe it was a minute or two-minute break at 10 – the quarterback position or the mids, they call them quarterbacks, linebackers, tight ends would run mm -hmm. 50s. And then the big the big boys would run 40s. And so 20 of them, you, uh, 20 of them. them. Right. So you're 10, 10 with 30 second rest. You get at halfway point, you get a two minute break and then you're right back into another 10. And once you're done with that test, now you're cheering on the next group. So it usually starts with the skill. Then it goes mids, then it goes uh, the bigs. And by the time you get to the bigs, all the all the skill and everybody are done. And so now you're cheering on the big boys because there's always a few stragglers right there that are working hard, laboring a little bit more than others. When you uh, were doing those tests, did you ever come close to not getting it done? 
No, never. I was always in good shape. Plus, those are my younger years. I could run for days. And so it, it was one of those things that was interesting because a lot of guys, they didn't want you to get so far out and like just dominate the run. So they'd say, pace yourself, pace yourself. You just have to pass within you know, the time period that they give you, which might have been seven seconds or something like that for mids. So you have to pass over the line in seven seconds, which isn't difficult to do if you're in shape. If you fail the conditioning test, you're truly not ready to, from a physical standpoint to play okay. at all. So you have to run a 50? So you have to run 20 50s? 20 50s. So it's seven seconds or less? Yeah. That's probably one of the easiest tests that I've taken. In other organizations, they've had – you had to run the half gassers, so you run across the field and back, and they would run 16 of those. That was a difficult one. And then the other one that was by far my nemesis, the one that nobody likes to run, was a 300-yard shuttle. We do 50 back, 50 back, 50 back, or in some cases, you'd have to go 25 and back, which is however many times – 300 yards worth and it's the change of direction and it's so <clears throat> taxing like you'd have to run two or three of those and i'm be like what are we doing we start training camp tomorrow these guys i mean their hamstrings are going to be shot so but the the new england test has always been 60s 50s and 40s how many guys and so you're doing that you're doing that the day before training camp that's actually a good point by you i guess you can't bring these guys any you can't bring them in any sooner than the collective bargaining agreement says they need to be in by but you're going through a pretty, for some guys, what is a pretty strenuous workout before you start real workouts. And then maybe guys have to be managed the next day. I don't know. It feels like there's a better way to do this thing. I understand everybody has to be in shape, but I just don't know how you do it and and feel good about everybody being really ready to go and practice starts 24 hours later. That was always an interesting part to me. Like I said, I think the New England Patriots method of how they do their conditioning test is more reasonable because it's not as strenuous as the 300 yard shuttle and you're not as not as taxing because you're literally running straight line and you can, for the most part, part stride it out. It's not like you're sprinting to make a 50 yard, you know, a 50 yards and come back and, and it's reasonable time. But that 300 yard shuttle, you're laboring. I mean, you're laboring, it's long distance, and especially for those big guys, those 300 pounders that are running a 300 yard shuttle, some of those defensive linemen, can you imagine Vince Wolford trying to run a 300 yard shuttle? No offense, Vince, I know you're in great shape. But I mean, it, it's a lot different for those big guys than it is for say the skill position. And then the next day you're up and firing, the next morning you're in full pads, ready to go, and you're, you're start, you're, you, you get going. The one great thing about that though is, as we've seen in the last few years, and Matt, you probably saw at the tail end when you were with the, the Lions just a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. The first week of camp has now turned into grab ass. Oh, right. Right. It, it's completely so different with you're the just new wandering CBA. around in a, in a mini camp extension. How many guys failed conditioning? And does Bill give you just a complete stink eye or Ivan Fears or whoever? I mean, they whoever. must they, they can't I mean, be entertained. As soon if there was probably over my tenure, I would have to say five, five to six guys I remember not making it. Usually a big, sometimes a mid, like an out of shape tight end or something like that. And if that's the case, some of those guys that were on the cusp, they'll just they're gone. Then there's other guys that are obviously going to be on the team. But if you don't make it, then guess what? You go. You have to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. You're in the weight room for, for conditioning. Then you have to continue to condition. You're not allowed to practice until you pass the conditioning test. So what happens is every day, I think it's every day or every other day leading up to the point where you have to um, take the test again. If you don't pass, you're still in a regimented 5 a.m. in the weight room, getting after it until you're in shape enough to where you can pass the test. They won't let you on the field. They won't let you suit up. They won't let you put on your helmet. So and it's how, almost it's almost embarrassing, right? Like, like you're be. sitting there. You're on the like during practice. They they put them through their drills where they're riding the bike. They're doing sit ups. They're doing push ups. They're doing everything that they could possibly do to make it as miserable and also at the same time you know, embarrassing for the player himself to sit there and all your teammates are watching this guy have to go through this instead of just being in shape and making the test. Yeah, Castle, meanwhile, is there a week early going through his whole Rocky montage, just getting ready for this thing. <laughs> and he just glides through it, no problem. Yeah, no problem. That's got to be oh, great. Yeah. How intense is Bill early in camp? Like, does he come into the first meeting, first day of training camp, and it's just – mid-season bill right from meeting one or is it a little bit more of a softer entry for you guys 
Uh, you know, it, it, Bill Bill stays consistent. That's the one thing that I always respect about him. No matter what the circumstance is, whether it's midseason, whether it's the first day of training camp, his message to the team is pretty consistent. And, and at the same time, he lays it out there like, hey, it doesn't matter where you are right now in terms of the depth chart. Don't worry about it. All you have to do is take care of what you need to do as a player and you're going to earn your playing time here it doesn't matter if you're a first round pick or if you're a free agent if you think if we think that you can help us if you're accountable to the team and if you go out there and you execute at a high level then you're going to be the guy playing we don't play favoritism here that's what that's one of the messages that was crystal clear every single time we started training camp was for every man in that room all 85 players or whatever it was back then um that Look, you, you have an opportunity to earn, earn earn a spot on this team if you go out and do what we ask you to do and you can show us that you can play and execute at a high level. Because at the end of the day, that's what, all you want to hear is, as as a player, especially a guy like myself and a seventh round draft pick that when I came into the and they put up the depth chart, it was Brady, it was Rohan Davey, it was Doug Flutie, it was Chris Chris Redmond earlier, they let go of Chris Redmond by the time we got to camp, so I was fourth on the depth chart. So then all you all you sit there and do is say, okay, I understand where I'm at right now, but it didn't mean that that couldn't change throughout the course of training camp. Phil, I love the question about what Bill's tenor is at the beginning of these things, and it leads into Chris Long, our buddy who does the Greenlight podcast. He had Michael Bennett, who was with the Patriots a couple of years ago. He had him on as a guest, and here is how Chris Long explains Belichick setting his standards for players and Michael Bennett explaining why Bill Belichick's standards are so easily adhered to. This is great stuff. I build an organization built on the college mentality and built on fear, which in the NFL that does not work unless you build Belichick. But Bill Belichick doesn't really build it on fear. He just builds it on expectation, which is a whole different thing. Yeah, he builds it on consistent expectation. And that takes – if you set a bar that's consistent – and you're just matter of fact about it. And certainly different players get a little bit different leeway, but for that individual player, the expectations are clear. You must meet them. It takes all that awkward, like, how do I treat my players? Like, am I too authoritative? Can I be the cool guy here? What's my personality as a coach? If you just focus on the results and the expectation, then you can be yourself, but you just enforce that expectation. I think that's what Bill does a really good job of. And, you know, the funniest motherfucker you ever met, though. He's his jokes in the goddamn meetings. Yeah. Like, damn, he, we talk about himself. We talk about everybody. But one thing I never forget that Bill Belichick did. He got in that meeting, in that spring meeting, and said, uh, "He started listening. We won twenty two AFC championships, and he started going off. So I don't care about your fucking opinions." I was like, "Damn, Bill!" Like, you know, how he goes to that meeting and tells about all the wins, quarterbacks, MVPs, and all this shit. It's like this shit fucking works. And it's like when he does that. That sets the tone. But when you can't do that, that doesn't set the tone. When you're a coach that comes in first year and you're trying to say, I'm going to change the Jacksonville Jaguars because I have proof. You don't have proof. Bill Belichick has proof. And when he drops that, when he drops his nuts and shows you everything, it just kind of, you kind of be like, all right, I got to follow the line because whatever he's doing, it fucking works. The nut dropping. The nut yeah. dropping makes it all, doesn't it, Phil? <laughs> I just, I find that to be really interesting, Matt, because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you've been in those meetings, but it does sound like, New England is the kind of place where they say, you know, it's it's not what you have done. It's what you will do or what you're you are doing in the here and now. And there you have the guy who leads the whole thing saying, you know, meeting one. OK, so here's my resume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You I know, mean, like, yeah. like, listen up. But the standard for him as the coach and the boss is different than the standard for the employees. And when your resume is what it is and you're Bill Belichick. I get why you would want to present that just to set an expectation level right there. Right. There's a standard of excellence that that is definitely portrayed with how he approaches the team and with his expectation level. And I don't think that there's ever a point where you don't understand what the expectation level is, right? And he'll he he's one of those coaches also though that he's not going to talk about, hey, our goal is to win the Super Bowl. Our goal is to go. Obviously, that is the goal every single year, but his goal each and every day is one day at a time. And don't worry about tomorrow before you get there, right? It, it's it's literally concentrate on what you have to do today. And he and you clearly understand that as a player, but you also understand that you're coming into an organization that has had tremendous success over the years and there's a formula for that success. And he's gonna have hold you to that standard each and every day. And that's how he approaches it with his coaches. That's how his coaching staff approaches it with their players. And so you clearly, there, there's no middle 
middle ground. Like you say, okay, this is where I have to be. And if I'm not there, they're going to hold me accountable. They're going to get after me. And, and that's the type of coaching that's going to take place. And so you, you just, you, you understand it and you have to get accustomed to that. And it's a mentally tough environment. You, you got to be mentally tough as a player because every single day, if you're not on your, at your best, you're going to get called out for it. There's no doubt and, about that. And that whole speech too, I guess, guys would specifically maybe be targeted to and resonate with a player like Michael Bennett. I mean, you're not having that speech for Jack Jones. Well, maybe you are. I don't know. You're not having that speech for Tyquan Thornton. You're having the speech when you give that speech about here's all the stuff I have done. So if you think you know because you played in Seattle and won a Super mm. Bowl and were one of the best players in football, I appreciate that. That's why you're here. But I know what the flip I'm doing, so we're going to do it my way. So it's interesting the audience that those might be targeted to. Now, the Patriots in 2022 don't have a hell of a lot of guys that they've imported. Devontae Parker might qualify. Nelson Aguilar is, is a guy in his second year. But one thing I want to ask about is we kind of continue to plumb what first days of camp are like, Matt, is those first practices, they must be a jumble of – nerves for some players who want to make impression then you have veterans who are just trying to get back into the pool and get their you know okay it must just you have nine guys out there running around and everybody has all of their antenna up and they're amped up in different ways is it not mass hysteria but, but i mean even the coaches you're gonna have excuse me you're gonna have patricia and judge and a new running backs coach the dynamic must be interesting of a team. Is it always different in the first few days to get the vibe of what the team is like? It is, but you have a good understanding of it because you're coming out of OTAs. You have mini ah. camps, so they've ha had a full off season, so that you kind of know what to expect going into camp. Because really, that is very much replicated when you get into full camp. But there's always more, more. At, uh, more, more at stake, I guess, the anticipations there. And mm -hmm. like you said, no matter how far you get in, I played 14 years in the league. The first day of training camp, when you get into actual pads and you get to get out there on the field and get going, there's butterflies. Like there's this anticipation like, okay, we're here. Season has arrived. This is what we've been working for. You don't have that same um, – you don't have that same sense when you're going through OTAs and mini camp, but when you get to camp, you know that, Hey, we've only got a small finite period of time in which we can get better before we start preseason games. And now with only three preseason games and with the rules being different with a lot more walkthroughs with the days off that, that, that time flies by. So you know that you're starting your journey right now for the 2022 season immediately when you step on that field and get going, you've got to be right. And you've got to be right each and every day. And this is where you get better because camp really, does allow you that time to get better on a daily basis focus primarily only on football and spend as much time as you need to on getting yourself right to get into season because once season starts then it's a whole different animal week in and week out's always mm -hmm. different but you're going and you don't have time to come up for air so this is a great period of time but everybody's excited to get started and and i don't care if you're like i said an older vet or if you're a new guy there is this anticipation this revved up um, attitude when you get going and you get started. Matt, put yourself uh, in Mac Jones's shoes and your second year quarterback and your in your second year as a starter. Do you think going into camp? You mentioned you know you've already had these spring practices, so there is some you know uh, level of expectation as to how things will function already. Is there any room once training camp begins for drastic day to day change? in terms of how you interact with the staff. Meaning we saw one thing during the spring, right? Where Max working a lot with Joe judge and he's seen, you know, he's with Matt Patricia. Sometimes he's with Bill Belichick. Sometimes would they change things up drastically from what we saw a month ago, month and a half ago to this week, or should it be almost exactly the same as to what we saw before? I know you've never been in a situation exactly like this one before with the staff that they have right now. But would that be weird if all of a sudden, for instance, Matt Patricia was everywhere where Mac Jones was in a training camp practice when that wasn't the case a little while ago? I think so. I don't think that there's any time for dramatic change, right? And at the same time, I think what you saw throughout the spring is probably similar to what you're going to see now. Because going into 
even the OTAs, I think that they had a clear cut idea. Bill Belichick did with Matt Patricia, Joe Judge, how things were going to operate, how they were going to run, who was going to be in the room as a quarterback coach versus who was going to be kind of seen as the offensive coordinator. So I don't think that that's going to change because if they did that now, then I don't think that they really knew what they were doing early on. Now, the interesting part for me is going to be who's calling plays. When you get to the preseason game, that's going to be very evident in terms of how they're going to, how that operation is going to work because that's something that you can't really replicate in practice. Yes, you, the, somebody can be calling in plays from the sideline into the huddle and kind of work your work those mechanics of coach to quarterback there, but then it's much different when you're out of that practice format and when the play clock's running and you're all of a sudden, you're calling your first and 10 play and all of a sudden you're anticipating a run for five yards and now you're thinking about your second, second and five play, but you get stuffed and now it's second and 11, mm -hmm. what's your next call? So you, as a play caller, especially a new play caller, those are the things that are going to be very interesting to watch develop over preseason and how that's done and how quickly they can adapt to those types of situations. Because as a play caller, look, there's so many different angles and so many different situations that you always have to be one, two plays ahead, but you also have to be prepared if it goes awry and you don't get that positive run on first down and now you're second and long. Now you have to adapt to that and say, okay, what's my second long call? So it'll, it'll that, that's, I think will be more interesting as you go along in training camp. Matt, I think one of the most fascinating aspects of 2022 is going to be the relationship between Joe Judge and Mac Jones. Joe is an intense guy. He's a fiery guy. He can be a wordy guy. But Mac has more experience as an NFL quarterback and really in running an NFL offense than Joe Judge does, even though he was a head coach. How much are you going to scrutinize how those two get along post McDaniels? Well, I think it's it's one of the most pivotal and important relationships that you can have is a quarterback and whoever the quarterback coach is or the offensive coordinator, because there's got to be a collaboration. And Joe Judge has to understand, like you just pointed out, look, he hasn't been calling plays. He hasn't been coaching quarterbacks in the league for, for any period of time. And so he's going to have to lean a little bit on Mac Jones, even if he's a second year player, because Mac Jones does have experience in this offense. And then there's got to be that open conversation about, Hey, what do you like? What don't you like? And if that happens, then they can be, have a lot more success. And I think unless Joe judge comes in and he's trying to play hard ass and like, Hey, well, the interpersonal we're going to do it my way. Matters, right, Phil. I mean, right. we've seen Joe, the interpersonal stuff matters and we, and Joe can come on strong, Phil. Uh, he can, and we can, you know, we can hear him out there on the practice field at times. And so uh, it's going to be a very different dynamic in the quarterback room this year because of the personalities involved. But it does seem to me, and this is, again, this is based off of what we saw in the spring. It, it did look like Patricia was going to be the, the play caller, maybe. You know, it was during the most right, competitive 11-on-11 11 stuff that it was this guy who has spent the vast, vast majority of his pro career as a defensive coach and some time as a head coach where you worked with him, Matt, right. now being charged with the most important role offensively on the sidelines. That's what it looks like, at least. I, we should just ask you this, Matt. You played for him. Do you think he could be an offensive coordinator? I do think Matt Patricia could be an offensive coordinator. Now, he started his career on the offensive side of the ball in the offensive line room when I was even with the New England Patriots. So he understands the dynamics of the offensive line, the run game. And even when I was in Detroit, look, this guy's a grinder. He's going to do whatever he can to get you prepared. And he'd come in on Tuesdays and very much like what – Bill Belichick did with the quarterbacks when I was there, he'd break down the defensive scheme. He'd break down player strengths and weaknesses, cornerbacks, safeties, just overall um, scheme in general of the defensive coordinator that we were going up against. So he's very knowledgeable of defense adjustments and, and what holes they might have. So that will translate hopefully really well for him as it, as it comes to calling plays because he can take advantage of certain defenses and schemes because he's so knowledgeable about it. And then again, but it is a major transition. It's not calling just defense. It's actually calling offense and calling an offensive plays because there's so much uncertainty from one play to the next or the success of one play to the next and, and how you call that game and especially situational football that there'll be a major adjustment and it'll just be interesting to see how well he, he does in, in that new role. Like in a vacuum, offensive coordinator, just the word coordinator, it it does seem manageable if you have management skills. And I think that Patricia does, Detroit notwithstanding. 
He gets along with people. He's a smart guy. He understands, you know, collect the information from my offensive line coach, collect the information from my tight ends coach, understand what the, the opposition we're going against is. But in the heat of a game, I would imagine, right, guys? They have, an, uh, you know, something that they want to exploit as play caller and offensive coordinator team. Say somebody gets hurt on the other side. Say somebody gets hurt on your side. You have to rejumble, reconfigure, and re- and just completely maybe throw out the script of what you were planning to do because something happens. And I think that's what's what's really interesting is I, I don't have – I think we have been a little bit too – apocalyptic about how bad things will be with Patricia, Phil. We talked about this on early edition the other day. I mean, they're not going to line up to, in the wrong direction and start, you know, snapping the ball over the quarterback's head on the regular. But um, I think it's going to be better than we think just because our expectations are so low. I think that's, I think that's possible. And I think if it is, I think a lot of that will be due to the guy with the ball in his hands. I think Mac Jones, I think the team is lucky in that, they got the rookie quarterback last year, who is probably the most ready to go of the bunch, who is probably the best processor of the bunch. And so now at least you have him as your fail safe, right? So if you want to do that, you know, Matt, you've talked to us about this before. You want to call two plays in the huddle and you want to just trust your quarterback to get to the line of scrimmage and understand what the best look is and tap his helmet, alert, alert, or give him the different signals, you know, to your receivers so you can alter their routes. These are all things we've seen him do just as a rookie. You know, I I think you are fortunate if you're the New England Patriots, because I don't think there are a lot of young quarterbacks that would be able to do that. Matt, how involved could Mac Jones be on the play calling side of it? I know, you know, he will have a voice in his ear. That's what we all believe, right? That there'll be somebody there relaying some sort of signal to him. But how much say could he have, whether it's at the line of scrimmage or even just during the week in terms of laying out what he likes? Because I think people, honestly, Tom, locally, I think this is what you're getting at. I think people would be a lot more at ease if they just, you know, said to themselves, well, you know, Mac will just be doing, you know, what he wants out there. He'll be getting some guidance, but he'll essentially be, be mm-hmm. you know, running his own show out there. Right. I mean, I don't think he's at that level. And it's also the confidence level that he has of being able to express the, the those thoughts, right? As yeah. you get into the offensive meeting room, how comfortable is he going up to Joe Judge and Matt Patricia and saying, I hate this play, right? And if we get this, I want to check to this. And so there, there's always those circumstances throughout the course of a game that you get all of a sudden a certain look, they're playing man coverage. You, you have a play that was really built to beat too high and then all of a sudden you have to check protection it could be a blitz anything like that and you're signaling all of a sudden you always have those capabilities within this offensive structure to do that and if mac jones is comfortable doing that then you will absolutely see that then there's other times you get a check with me and they might call two plays in the huddle and they start three three receivers on one side they motion one over well immediately you know if all three cornerbacks are on the same side it's man so we're running the man beater if it's zone because the cornerback stayed over here well then guess what we're going to alert it we're going to check to the zone beater and now you put yourself in an advantageous position to be successful so those things are built in but then there's other plays where it's true play action and it's a progression read and you're just going through your progression so there's all different types of circumstances in which mac jones will have the ability to check out to do the check with me's but at the end of the day look you're going to have a game plan set forth that you think will beat and a belichick i'm sure will be a big part of that too to beat a particular defense or a particular defensive coordinator and what they do from a situational standpoint what they do with their tendencies and then from there like there's adjustments that have to be made on the field or on the sideline and that will be mainly between mac jones and and joe judge and matt patricia whoever's whoever the the powers that be are all involved in that process all right we got to put a cork in this a little bit we're going to be back at it again tomorrow phil and i as the patriots have access to bill belichick and a few of their reigning captains or their 2021 captains we'll talk to camp begins on wednesday but one thing that i want to close with that you mentioned was the ability of Mac Jones to say, Hey, I hate this. Mm -hmm. Is it important that he has his voice, that his voice is heard, that he's taking ownership? I mean, it has to be right. It has to be. I mean, as a quarterback, you're the guy out there on the field, you're the guy out there pulling the trigger. And so if there's something that you're, 
not very comfortable with, more than likely it's not going to be as successful as it is if you call a play that you know really well and you have answers for everything that they're going to offer or throw at you, you're going to somehow find a way to make that successful. And so for him, as a, as a young player, that's what I've always tried to impress upon the guys that I played with as I got older, that maybe I was backing up, whether it's a Christian Ponder, whether it's a Teddy Bruce here, whether the Marcus Mariota when he was young in Tennessee, it's legitimately telling them, hey, you're the guy. You're in the most important position. At the end of the day, they can call any play that they want. But if you hate the play, you are the guy out there that has to go out and execute. So did make sure. Did McDaniels embrace that? Did McDaniels I, embrace that when you did it to him? You know what, McDaniels, I learned that from Tom. And, and really, it's it's also how you approach it, right? If you're an asshole and come and say, you, whatever you guys just drew up and spent all night, Tuesday, Wednesday night, staying up until 12, sleeping at the office, those plays suck. Cross them all out. No, if you have a, if you have a respectable conversation, you go up and you say, hey, coach, I want to talk to you a little bit about a few different things. Let him explain why he thinks the play is going to be successful. But at the end of the day, you go out and you've, you've – even repped it in practice once or twice that week, and you say, still, you, it, it, I don't I don't feel comfortable with it, then all of a sudden it would be silly for uh, somebody, an offensive coordinator, a quarterback coach to sit there and say, well, we're still going to call it mm -hmm. because I don't care what you think. That's not going to build a strong relationship. And what you're trying to do with Mac Jones right now is build a new relationship with somebody that you're not as familiar with. That respect factor is huge, Phil, isn't it? If Mac Jones – as much as a model teammate and player as he seems to be, if he doesn't feel like he's being put in great positions by his coaches, it's not a good recipe. But again, I don't think it'll be as apocalyptic as we think. Do not think, think that. Phil, last word. No, I I agree with you. Listen, I've said this team should win 10 games. The offense is at times going to have to be the unit that carries them. Yep. So, so, you know, defensively what they're working with, I think, you know, you're going to see some more fits and starts on that side of the ball. I just, uh, I, I do think everyone, Mac Jones included, and I think this will be the case, whoever's involved in that offensive structure, power structure, everyone's going to have to approach it with a little bit of humility. And, hmm. and that hasn't always been what we know and have heard about Matt Patricia in Detroit. It just, it hasn't always been the case, but I, I think if everyone acknowledges their, their obvious you know, shortcomings in a certain area. It's new for everybody, this experience. If they can do that and really work together, I think the results could be positive. All right, Matt. Hey, where people can catch you because now you're branching out. You're not just with us. You're on who? Right 33rd? Uh, 33rd team. Yep. We're going to start doing um, some segments a few times a week throughout the course of the season. And it's more of an in-depth analysis on different aspects of quarterback play. Today, we talked a little bit about leading up to training camp you know, different quarterback battles going around in the NFL right now and a lot of different moving parts in terms of where quarterbacks are going to be. There's going to be nine teams with definitely new starting quarterbacks this year. So just more in-depth analysis. And uh, it, it, I'm looking forward to doing some of that as well. All right. Don't be awesome. don't be cheating on your boys. Appreciate hey, it. I would never. Hey, we like the 33rd team. We, we work with those guys, too. They, yeah, but they, we don't want to lose the guy. We don't want to lose Castle. We're not I mean, losing. We had Spielman for You're 15 not. minutes. He was on the 33rd team. He's gone. He wouldn't walk out on us like that. <laughs> I would never walk out on you. You guys, you guys are my number one and twos. One, switch, whatever, however you want to do it. Ones? Okay. Ones? Right. Ones? Okay, we're into the grab-ass portion. Goodbye. Bye.